This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, the world-famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. As for me, I'd like to leave you with one thought. Namely, the best way to begin a good meal is to start it off with a glass of Petri California Sherry. While you're waiting for dinner to be ready, just sit back, take it easy, and sip some of that wonderful Petri Sherry. Now, there's a wine. Hold that Petri Sherry to the light and look at that rich amber color. Smells good, too, doesn't it? And just wait for that first sip. What a flavor. No kidding, you'll find that Petri Sherry can turn the usual before-dinner lull into a real event. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. Try it. And say, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, just ask for Petri California Pale Dry Sherry. But no matter how you like it, you're sure to like it if the label says Petri. See for yourself. And now for the weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Tonight, we find him on the stage of the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. If you've bought a victory bond, you're welcome. I have, Doctor. Now, what's the recipe for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, now, let me see. Take equal parts of beautiful English countryside and black villainy. Mix them, add a dash of romance, a sprinkling of danger, season well with the usual theatrical condiments, and you have the case of the accidental murderess. Sounds like a tasty dish. Uh, how did the story begin, Doctor? On a beautiful summer day in 1895... Holmes had just concluded his famous investigation of the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca, an inquiry which was carried out at the express desire of His Holiness the Pope. And in consequence, the great man felt that a couple of weeks' rest in the heart of Warwickshire would be a pleasant change after our rather strenuous adventures in Italy. And so, Mr. Bartell, we went to Stratford-on-Avon. Oh, the home of Shakespeare, huh? Quite right, my boy. As a matter of fact, that was the reason that decided us to go there. Holmes was a great lover of the drama, you know. And at the time my story begins, the Shakespearean festival was in full swing. For the first week, our life there was calm and peaceful. During the daytime, we visited the local places of interest, such as Anne Hathaway's cottage and Shakespeare's birthplace. And the evenings found us at the theater. It was on a Tuesday, I remember, during our second week's stay that the trouble began. Holmes and I had gone for a walk through the nearby forest of Avon. He was in unusually good spirits that morning, and there was a distant, distinct, I mean, twinkle in his eye as he, as he said... Watson, for once I begin to wish that I were a man of wealth. Oh, and <clears throat> what makes you say that, Holmes? The beauty of this place, old fellow. I'm perfectly certain that I'd be happy in retirement here. It's rather depressing to think that in a week or two, the sordid necessity of making money will demand my return to Baker Street in a world of criminals. No, I must say that in an environment like this, it is a little hard to think of crime. How does the old saying go? Where every prospect pleases, and only man is vile. Yes, but uh, Shakespeare puts it even better, old chap. Oh, really? What's he say? Well, surely you remember the speech in... Uh, as you like it, we saw the production two nights ago. Oh, I don't remember the speech. How did it go? In this setting, it's really remarkably apposite. Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we but the penalty of Adam, the season's difference. Don't you remember? Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this our life exempt from public haunt finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. <laughs> Upon my soul, you read that much better than the fellow on the stage the other night. <laughs> Don't tell me I adopted the wrong profession, Watson. Oh, dear me, wait a minute. 
path seems to end here. Nothing but dense trees ahead of us. There's another path over there. I think it leads down to the river. Then let's follow it. The Avon is always... Great Scott, that was a... Ah. Holmes. Holmes, you hurt? Ah, yes, I think I am. Bullet hit my shoulder. I think it's only grazed it. Well, get off your coat quickly. Let's have a look. It's only a scratch. First, let's find out where it was fired from. I heard the thud of of a bullet in the tree behind me. Yes, here we are. Give me a pen knife, old fellow, will you? There you are. Thanks. Do you suppose that that shot was deliberate? Well, I can't imagine someone mistaking me for a rabbit, Watson. And by the way, uh, there was a curious echo to that shot. I don't know whether you noticed it. Uh Uh-huh. Here's the bullet. Now, let me see. I was standing there. A line from this bullet hole in the tree through the spot where I was standing would indicate that the shot was fired from that cluster of trees over there. Come on, Watson. Let's see what a search discloses. I wish you'd let me look at that shoulder before you start galloping all over the countryside, Holmes. You're bleeding quite profusely. Oh, plenty of time to look at it when we... Hello. Look over there. Uh, A man and woman running towards us across the clearing. Yes, and carrying guns. Yes, it looks as if it was an accident after all. Was anyone hurt? Yes, sir. My friend was hit in the shoulder. Oh, how dreadful. It's not a bad wound, is it? Oh, it's only a scratch, madam, I I hope. But you put the blood on your coat. Well... Just, um, how did this, uh, well, this accident happen, sir? Well, we were, we were out rabbit shooting. I was teaching my wife to use a rifle. I, I saw a rabbit scurry across the clearing. I raised the rifle and fired. It seemed to me, Geoffrey, that as I did so, you jolted my arm. Yes, I'm afraid I did, Alice. I was going to fire too, but as I raised my rifle, I jolted your elbow and sent your shot wild. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am, sir. Uh, here, uh, here's my card. Of course, we'll take care of any expenses that may be entailed. Well, the first thing to do is to find out how much damage has been done. You'd better take your coat off, old fellow. I, uh, I, I don't, think, don't think I can. Oh, he, he's badly hurt. No, it, it's just that... Oh, oh. the man's fainted. Oh, this is dreadful. Uh, I have a horse and trap down the road. Excellent, give me a hand with him, will you? Uh, I must get him to a hospital as, as fast as possible. <laughs> Holmes, are you feeling any better? Has the nurse gone? Yes, yes, yes. She's bringing the house surgeon. And the uh, man and his wife? They're down in the hospital waiting room. Oh. I found out their name. It's it's Markham. Then we're alone. Yes, 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 old fellow. In that case, I can stop behaving as if I were at death's door. Holmes, you mean that you... You shammed that collapse just now? <laughs> yes, yes, I did, Watson. Well, oh, spare me well, a little pity, old chap. My shoulder is confoundedly painful, I assure you. Well, uh, I'm sure it is. But what made you pretend to faint? I recognized this Mrs. Markham, and I think she recognized me. It's important she assume I'm out of action for a while. Oh? Mrs. Markham. Why? Well, Mrs. Markham is, uh, in reality, the notorious Mrs. Dangerfield. You remember the Dangerfield case? The Dangerfield? Great, Scott, yes. She was tried for the murder of her husband by poisoning, wasn't she? Yes, she was, old fellow. She was acquitted when the jury decided he was an habitual arsenic addict who happened to take an accidental overdose. Well, didn't you have some connection with the case? It was I who tracked down the sale of the arsenic she claimed to have bought for cosmetic purposes. Well, if you ask me, that shot at you was no accident. Oh, of course it wasn't. I'm certain that I was recognized. In any case, her record is a bad one. Uh, Prior to her husband's death, there was an episode in which her uncle was killed in a shooting accident on a grouse moor in Scotland. An uncle who left her a large fortune on his death. And I suppose Mrs. Dangerfield was a member of the shooting party when the uh, accident happened. (laughs) Yes, she was. Now, she's something of a femme fatale, Watson. I must plan my actions very cautiously. I'm up against a dangerous opponent. Well, you'll have to stay in the hospital until your wound's being examined and dressed. That's true, old fellow. And while the local staff are taking care of that, I want you to shadow the Markham. Of course I will, Holmes. Stick close to them, old fellow. Make them believe that I'm going to be kept here for some days. Find out as much as you can and then report to me. Right, I'll do my best. <laughs> It's it's awfully kind of you, Mrs. Markham, to insist on having me back to your house for lunch. My dear Dr. Watson, 
After injuring the famous Mr. Holmes, it's the least I could do. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Jeffrey, dear, will you bring us some sherry? It's Ada's day off, you know. Very well, Alice. Uh, is anyone else coming to lunch? Only Dennis Romney. Oh, Lord, that fellow seems to live here. Well, I'll go and get the sherry. Sit down, won't you, Dr. Watson? Oh, thank you, madam, thank you. You, uh, you say that you think Mr. Holmes will be in the hospital for some days? I'm afraid so. The wound wasn't serious. He lost quite a bit of blood. Oh, I feel perfectly dreadful about it. Well, you mustn't blame yourself too much, madam. It was an accident. Yes, but I might so easily have killed him. Well, you haven't, and that's all that matters. Uh, did you say that, uh, Dennis Romney was coming to lunch? Is that the actor fellow from the Memorial Theatre? yes. Have you seen him on the stage? Yes, 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 several times. Holmes and I have been going to the festival regularly since we came down here. A fine actor, isn't he? A shame they give him such poor parts. Well, wasn't he good? Imagine them letting that frightful Basil Grant play Hamlet last night, while Dennis only played Laertes. Yes. Dennis is three times a better actor. <laughs> I suppose he is. He, uh, he's coaching me in acting. Oh, coaching you? Really? Is he? Yes, he thinks that I may be able to get small parts here next season. I've always had a great urge to go on the stage, but no one's ever encouraged me before. Oh, here's Jeffrey. Uh, this sherry is rather special, Doctor. Harry's de la Frontera. <laughs> Only a few bottles left. Oh, that's very nice of you, sir. Oh, that must be Dennis. I'll go let him in. Uh, we, might as, <laughs> we might as well have a drink. You'll find it'll help making this actor fellow more tolerable. I take it, Mr. Markham, that you're not an admirer of Mr. Dennis Romney's... Can't bear him. He's always quoting Shakespeare and behaving generally as if he were another Irving. <laughs> He's got Alice completely fooled. Here's a glass, Doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Dennis, I want to introduce you to Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Romney? How do you do, sir? Hello, Geoffrey. Uh, want a glass of sherry? Uh, thanks. That'd be very nice. Are you um, a disciple of the theater, Dr. Watson? Well, hardly a disciple, sir, but I've been attending the festival during the last week. I enjoyed your performances immensely, if I may say so. Oh, you may say so, Doctor. Here's your sherry, Dennis. Oh, don't be crotchety, Geoffrey. And please remember that Dennis is our guest. Oh, it's all right, Alice. I know that Geoffrey's bark is a good deal worse than his bite. <clears throat> and, uh, and what play are you appearing in tonight, Mr. Romney? King Lear. I shall once again portray the thankless role of the King of France. Oh, dear me, dear While that incredibly bad actor, Basil Grant, tears a multitude of passions to tatters in his rendition of Lear... Oh, horrible, horrible, most horrible. I thought his Hamlet was atrocious last night, Dennis. Wasn't it? When he came to his final line, the rest is silence. It was as much as I could do to prevent cheering. I felt rather the same way when you were killed in the duel, Dennis. Oh, Geoffrey, <laughs> you're being intolerably rude. Why don't you take Dr. Watson upstairs and show him your butterfly collection? Then at least you'll know what you're talking about. Are you interested in butterflies, Doctor? I, I have quite a rare collection. Oh, really? I'd like to see them very much. Come on, then. Uh, I think we've just got time before lunch. Try and bring yourself down with a few better manners, Geoffrey, dear. I'm really quite an easygoing man, Doctor, but the arrogance of that fellow Romney infuriates well, me. Well, I must say, he does seem to have rather a good opinion of himself. Don't, uh, don't put too much weight on that balcony rail. It's absolutely full of wormholes. <laughs> Part of the attraction of an old house, my wife tells me. <laughs> but I regard it as confoundedly dangerous. Yeah, and this is my little museum. <laughs> In these cases, I think you'll find some of the finest specimens of Lepidoptera you've ever seen. It's my hobby, and I may say that, with the exception of the Natural History Museum, I doubt if you'll find a finer collection. It must have taken you years to collect them. Oh, it has. Many years, many disappointments, and a great deal of patience. <laughs> Look at this fellow. He's my prize specimen. A North American monarch. North American monarch? Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, isn't he? And this is an admiral. Well, of course yeah, I know him. Very rare. And this is a perfect bee-hawk moth. Bee -hawk and uh, moth. here's an emperor. Ever see more exquisite markings? Well, never. Uh, tell me, Mr. Markham, when you captured a butterfly, how do you kill it without marking it in any way? With poison. Oh? What poison? Cyanide. Not arsenic? You heard me say cyanide, Doctor. The only reason I mention it is that a friend of mine collected butterflies once, and I'm certain that he always used arsenic to kill them. Why do you keep talking of arsenic? 
Are you trying to hint at something? No, 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 my dear fellow. I was just curious, that's all. Yes. A trifle too curious, perhaps. Huh, there's the luncheon gong. Let's go downstairs again. Ah, uh, so, man, uh, I didn't mean to offend you. Oh, of course you didn't. But my nerves are a little on edge today. It must be that accident to your friend that's upset him. I really must get that balcony rail mended. What is it, sir? My wife and young Romney. They're going into lunch. Listen. But darling, why won't he understand? Oh, 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 oh you expect him to death. Jeffrey has no imagination. He's never understood me. Well, Doctor, they say that listeners never hear good of themselves. You know, sometimes I wonder if my wife wouldn't like me out of the way. Well, let's go down to lunch, shall we? And so, Holmes, that's the story up to now. A very interesting one too, Watson. So you think that uh, Mrs. Markham is planning to kill her husband, eh? Oh, it's obvious. She's in love with the actor fellow, Dennis Romney. Her husband's in the way, and if she doesn't want to use poison this time, there's a... A perfect setting for murder in that crumbling balustrade on the landing. Mm -hmm. One push when he wasn't looking and it'd be the end of him. And no one could prove that she did it. A charming household. And Mr. Markham became very evasive, you say, when you mentioned arsenic. Yes. I said it deliberately, of course, to see how he'd react. If you ask me, he knows that his wife has arsenic in the house. And he was trying to protect her. You've exerted your charm sufficiently to arrange to see them again, I trust. Oh, well, yes. As a matter of fact, I have. They're taking a picnic tea and going boating on the Avon this afternoon. They asked me to join them. Of course, I, I agreed. I just rushed back here to the hospital to report to you first. You've done splendidly, Watson. Splendidly. Oh, thanks so much, Well, uh, But uh, I've been so busy hmm. telling you what I've found out that I haven't asked you about you. Um, uh, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine, old fellow. Fine. Uh, what did the house surgeon discover? A very interesting fact. Look in the drawer beside my bed, will you? Great Scott, it's, it's a bullet. A bullet that the house surgeon removed from my shoulder. But, but we found a bullet in the tree also. Precisely. Therefore, two bullets were fired. But, good Lord, that means... It means, old chap, that we have a dangerous task ahead of us. Not to solve a murder, but to prevent one. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's unusual story in just a moment. Meanwhile, I'd like to remind you that good cooking becomes wonderful cooking if you serve your good food with a Petri wine. If you like a red wine, say with meat or any meat dish, try Petri California Burgundy. If white wine's your favorite, then you'll love Petri California Sauterne. It's wonderful. But Burgundy or Sauterne, whichever you prefer, it's just bound to be good if you see the letters... P-E-T-R-I on the bottle. Because Petri wine is always good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what happened next? We left you at Sherlock Holmes' bedside in the hospital. Did the picnic with Mr. and Mrs. Markham prove an exciting one? No, no, it was rather unpleasant, as a matter of fact. The three of them kept squabbling all the time, and just as we were coming home, something unforeseen occurred. Mr. Markham fell into the river. Well, pardon the old question, Doctor, but uh, did he fall or was he pushed? It was hard for me to say. I had my back to him when he fell. Uh, of course, we fished him out and rattled him back home in a trap as fast as we could. He changed his clothes at once, and as we sat round the fire a little later, I could see that he'd caught a chill. In fact, I recommended that he go to bed and stay there. Mrs. Markham uh, agreed with me. Jeffrey, dear, I... I do wish you'd follow Dr. Watson's advice and go to bed. For the fifth time, Alice, I will not go to bed. I'm perfectly all right. Now, it's no thanks to you and Dennis. And what do you mean by that remark, Geoffrey? You know perfectly well what I mean. It wasn't an accident that I fell in the river just now. One of you two pushed me when I was struggling with the punt pole in the long reeds. Geoffrey, you're talking rubbish. Am I? You were in the boat, Dr. Watson. Didn't you see what happened? No, I didn't, sir. My back was turned to you when you fell in. Oh, well, then, we'll call it an accident. An accident that happened by a curious coincidence, just where the river is deepest and the reeds thickest. Geoffrey, I don't like your tone. You can accuse me of anything you like, but when you start suggesting that if Alice... If you don't is... like the way I talk to my wife, I suggest that you don't come to my house. I'm going to get a scarf. I'm chilly. <sighs> Dr. Watson, I... 
I must apologize for my husband's behavior. I don't know what's come over Oh, him. that's quite all right, Mr. Markham. I quite understand. Well, I wish I did. I, I don't mind him yelling at me, but he's being so abominably rude to you, Alice. The last couple of weeks, it's been getting worse than ever. I know. Ever since we had that argument about the insurance policies, he's been unbearable. Insurance? Yes, Doctor. We took out quite large policies on each other's lives recently. You you didn't tell me that, Alice. Well, it, it was his idea. And yet when the insurance man came here, you'd have thought I was forcing him into taking out the policy. Insurance? Great Scott, I... I... You what, Doctor? I... Uh, oh, nothing, Mr. Markham. No, 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 nothing at all. Sounds as if you don't approve of insurance, sir. Oh, it's not that, Romney. It's just that I... Oh, who can that oh. be? I wasn't expecting anyone. Answer the door, yeah, Dennis, will you? Oh, yes, you oh, Sounds yes. as if Jeffrey's already yes. done so. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Alice, we have a visitor. Holmes, you shouldn't be up. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Markham. Hello, Watson. Well, uh, I'm delighted to see you, Mr. Holmes. Though I understood from your friend that you'd be in the hospital for several days. The constitution of an ox and the obstinacy of a mule, two characteristics of mine, have combined in making possible an early departure from the hospital. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Romney? I think I've seen you at the theatre. My name is Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, sir? You'll stay to supper, I hope. If it's not inconvenient, Mrs. Markham. Of course it isn't. I'll go in and arrange for it. Upon my soul, Holmes, I, I'm glad to see you. And are you all, fellow? Let's take a stroll on the terrace, shall we? It's rather warm inside this evening. You can go out through the French windows. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Markham. Holmes, are you quite sure that you're well enough to go walking about? Of course I am. You must tell me, Watson, what the latest developments are. In the meantime, I myself have not been idle. Yes, Watson, I think our stage is set, and I have a feeling that I may contribute to a rather dramatic last act curtain. <laughs> A delightful meal, Mrs. Markham. Oh, well, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're not eating very much. My appetite is a trifle jaded. The mental fencing that we have indulged in during the meal has been somewhat disturbing. I don't understand you. Oh, come now, madam. I know that you were once Mrs. Dangerfield, and you know that I know it. Why keep up the pretense any longer? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But we needn't converse in lowered voices. I'm sure that you've told Dr. Watson whatever there is to know, and perhaps more. I admire your courage, madam. Geoffrey, Dennis. Yes, sir. I want you to listen to this. Mr. Sherlock Holmes knows that I was once Mrs. Dangerfield. He's apparently under the impression that this is a dark secret of mine. Mr. Holmes, Geoffrey knew and loved me before I ever married Mr. Dangerfield. Of course I did, Holmes. He stood by me during the horrible trial after my first husband's death. And I told Dennis about the whole miserable business months ago. So I really don't see that you've uncovered any great secret. Not yet, Mrs. Markham, but I have a feeling that it's only a matter of moments. So you haven't got any secrets from Dennis either, eh? There's no need to shout, Geoffrey. And there's no need for Dennis to be in my house. Get out, Romney, and stay out. This business between you and Alice has gone far enough. I'll go when Alice tells me to. Well, if you won't go, then I'm not going to sit here. I'm... I'm going upstairs. You're shaking like a leaf, sir. You've got a fever. Don't you think you'd better go to bed? Mind your own business and leave me alone. Uh, Mrs. Markham, I really think you should persuade your husband to go upstairs and lie down. Don't worry, Mr. Holmes. I know how to handle him. I'll take him up. Put an arm around my shoulder, Geoffrey. Come along. We should follow them, Holmes. They have to pass that crumbling banister on the landing. With him in that state, she, she might try to... What are you suggesting, shh, Doctor? Shh, shh. Come and watch, both of you. We can observe them both from the foot of the stairs here. They're on the landing. She's on the outside. Look, 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 look. Markham stumbled against her. He's pushed her against the railings. Look out! Everybody, Come on, get the stairs! Oh. Alice, are you all right? Yes, but Geoffrey tried to push me through the railing. That's a lie. No, it isn't, sir. The three of us were watching you from below. But the railing held. I, I don't understand. I can explain that, Watson. This afternoon, while you were all at your picnic, I came here with a local carpenter. You had informed me, old fellow, that it was the maid's day off, and I took the liberty of reinforcing that decaying woodwork. What the blazes do you think you've been up to, Holmes? Preventing murder, sir, and finding the true solution to the Dangerville case. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? The true solution? Surely it's obvious to you, Mrs. Markham. You have told us that your present husband loved you before you married Mr. Dangerfield. 
It was he who accidentally killed your uncle so that you might inherit a fortune. It was he who accidentally gave your first husband an overdose of arsenic. Arsenic that he obtained for the purpose of destroying butterflies. Yes, yes, yes. And it was he who tried to send you to your death by pushing you through those railings. And all the time, Mrs. Markham, I thought that you were the potential murderer. You fellows have got hold of the wrong end of the stick. All I've been trying to do is to conceal the fact that my wife was a murderer. Jeffrey, how can you say that? Markham, if you were... Just a moment, Mr. Romney. I'm not through with him yet. This talk is all very dramatic, Mr. Holmes, but I wonder how you're going to be able to prove it. Dr. Watson, Mr. Romney and I will testify to the attempt that you've just made on Mrs. Markham's life. Yes, and what about the attempt on your life, Holmes? Obviously, it was Markham who fired at you in the woods. But my wife has already admitted firing the shot. Uh, true, sir. But two shots were fired. The one that your wife fired, we found in the tree. The one that you fired was extracted from my shoulder in the hospital. Then the two shots were fired simultaneously. You remember, Watson, that I commented at the time on a curious echo. Mrs. Markham told us that her arm was jolted as she pulled the trigger. That was when the other rifle was fired. Mr. Markham didn't want me on the scene when he staged his latest accident, and so he tried to kill me. What kind of a devil have I been living with all these years? I think I'm going to kill you, Markham. Don't come near me. Keep him away from me. I'll leave him to the law courts, Mr. Romney. British justice may be slow, as indeed it was in the Dangerfield case, but in the long run, it is sure. You'll find that out, Mr. Markham, on the gallows. Well, tell me, Doctor, did Mr. Markham finally end on the gallows? Yes, he did. And it might interest you to know that Mrs. Markham and Dennis Romney were married. A nice chap and a, and a fine actor, that boy. Hmm. Maybe that's what I should have been, an actor. Hmm? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble <coughs> in the mind to suffer. <coughs> well, what's the matter, Doctor? Don't you like it? The words are beautiful, but the, your delivery of them... Uh... Not good, huh? No, not good, Mr. Bartell. Okay. I'd rather talk about Petri wine anyway. Now, there's something to really talk about. Petri wine. A wine with generations of winemaking behind it. That's a fact, you know. The Petri family started making Petri wine generations ago. Oh, way back in the 1800s. So they've had the time to develop the art of winemaking, and they've been able to hand down that art from father to son, from father to son. Yes, the Petri family really knows how to turn luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. And those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the bottle, are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of Petri wine is good wine. It's got to be. Because don't forget, Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an exciting adventure Holmes and I had in North Africa. It begins at the headquarters of the Foreign Legion and ends with a strange death in the cafe of a thousand sighs. I call the story... Murder in the Casper. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Black Peter. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. This program originated in the Paramount Theater in Hollywood for an audience of Victory Bond Buyer. <laughs> this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>